So, welcome everyone to my talk, my story now. Um, it's a bit of a, hopefully, a different talk because uh, I want to show one part. So, we had a lot of talks which focused on like um, how to have a proper operating system for lots of courses, which is secure, which is safe. And I'm now representing the part which goes hacking wild because. Uh, as you probably read in my introductory text there, uh, lots of assumptions you usually have for an operating system like Linux, which I'm happily going to break now, just to scratch my itch. And I just want to put the elephant right away in the room. I implemented a logic analyzer inside the kernel, which pulls GPIOs rapidly and does so by uh, using an I in dash uh, uh, isolated core, not isolated in a way that it's isolated away from Linux and does run a separate operating system. One could do this as well. But it just tries to offload everything from this CPU core, disables IRQ and preemptions for how long it ever takes to sample all this data and collects the data. Now, um, the this is not a real logic analyzer because a logic analyzer has to give you like equidistant timings and you rightfully use hardware to do that. But as I will show you later, I had reasons for that to do it like this. But this is a reason I call it sloppy. And thanks for Marek to the motivation to call it sloppy because uh, that's what it is. It was really, I'm spoiling a little bit. Uh, uh, it worked for quite some of the cases I wanted to tackle, and so somehow with a, you get uh, one could get euphoric and say, "Yeah, it's a logic analyzer and can do lots of things." No, it's not a logic analyzer. It's at very, very best, it's a sloppy logic analyzer. Uh, but if you keep the restrictions in mind, I think you can do some uh, at least good first get first impressions. What's wrong? or uh, how is your system working? And because getting to the point where I'm now was quite uh, a bit of a road, even a roller coaster, one could say, for this talk, I please wait until the end of your questions because they may be answered later in the talk. So the task I was given and quite uh, regularly is when we get a new board, I should enable the IP cores on the board, be it I2C, be it the uh, uh, MMC, SD card, whatever. And um, as the initial task, the task is not so much check that the MMC core works, check that the PWM module produces exact 100 kilohertz. That's not the task. The ta we reasonably can assume it's the same IP core like from the previous SOC. It probably will work. Our first idea is now, does it work on this SOC? And this involves other things like uh, adding the DT bindings, enabling the clocks, setting the pin maxing. And as we in Renaissance, so I'm working from a Renaissance upstream kernel team, we have a rule to only send patches upstream once they are tested. Uh, I need to find out a way uh, so we have to test that. So, but we usually say, okay, I suppose she, I can talk to clients. That is good enough. P PWM, I see some output. Yeah, in the in the same magnitude, good enough for a first bring up for the first bring up everything here. The problem is now that uh, I, for ages, I work remotely from home, which is in Germany. And the new boards had some export regulations and were sitting in a lab in Japan. So, testing I2C communication is still possible, but uh, reading, P for example, PWM output is, well, it's too far away. And uh, one could argue, well, yes, um, put a logic analyzer, a hardware one in the lab, but this is, that had some issues. It's technic technically correct, of course, you can do that, but we have lots of boards in the lab. And if you want to do lots of bring up, you need lots of logic analyzers. Also, you have people, and we didn't have that, we didn't have the lo logic analyzers, and also you basically you would have need someone 
constantly, but putting it there, putting it there, wiring up like this, wiring up like that. Then also the lab is containing quite a complex setup, so accessing custom software to run the logic analyzers is also not super easy. And when I decided, uh, I don't know, we have a time shift also, so when I want to work on it and it's in the middle of the night of Japan, uh, then you're stuck as well. But what I did have, what, what was, was easily possible with our lab is just, uh, hey, could you put up some wires between these connectors and leave them there? That works, takes a day of delay maybe, but usually works. And then I found out what else have I, I have lots of iLink CPU cores. So this is, I wanted to, I'm after, sorry, I wanted to do live demos today, be, but because of tons of technical difficulties, I can just show you the board, which was actually, I developed this stuff locally on, but these are um, ARM64 cores, and depending on the SOC, they at least have two, but some of them even have eight CPU cores, and I usually run one of them, which uh, use one core which runs like I2C detect or writes something to the SD card. So most of the cores are idling around. So I think thought, yeah, let's make use of those. And yeah, I really wanted to scratch that itch. I have never done anything like this before. So I just thought hey, it must be possible. I'll, let's let's start. And yeah, so um, I'm presenting here because I just wanted to show you how such how such development can happen. Uh, it's a bit of a brown paperback situation. I'm happy that Steve is hacking right now because otherwise there might be points where he said, "Oh, why didn't you do it like this?" And, Oh, didn't know. Could happen. Um, yeah, if Thomas Gleixner was here, I might have got the knack of my lifetime. I don't know, but uh, we, it's not yet upstream. We will see what happens out of it. So I am not an expert. I just developed all my knowledge during, on this way. Did I get a thick skin after? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so uh, I really, I had for months discussions with Marek about the same thing. Is it a logic analyzer? No, it's not, but you should use one. No, I don't want to. Uh, I was still doing this stuff, so that was useful. That was a bit helping in all this process, but do I want to share what I develop? Yes, of course. So um, I tried to get it upstream. The GPO main, GPIO maintainers actually were quite positive about the uh, approach taken despite they haven't merged it yet, but we will see. Um, so far, I think besides me, only one person tested that and immediately found a bug. So um, it's not really widely used. I don't know if it will get accepted, but it is out there for anyone who thinks, well, it's not upstream, but I could use it for a, sim a situation similar to what I might show you on the next slides. So it's out there. Being merged or not, we will see. SGLA stands, of course, for Sloppy GPIO Logic Analyzer. Consisting of two parts, a kernel driver and a user space shell script. Actually, the kernel part was the easiest thing. I put the files in debug FS, you configure it, telling the frequency, the buffer size, if you want some triggers before sampling, and then when, when it should start. And as a result, you get out the data, some metadata, and some timing information. Was it done? No, no such, not a great surprise when it runs. So when you press basically the start trigger, it locks the CPU you configured, it waits for the triggers, it samples, and it unlocks the CPU again. So you could block that CPU for seconds if you want, or minutes, don't know, it depends on your trigger. Uh, the script was more complex. <laughs> because uh, the debug FS files are easy for the kernel part to handle, the so user sc space script has to do with quite some conversions. For example, I think the syntax for the trigger is quite neat, for the triggers is quite neat, but it's passed to the kernel as binary data. So that kind of conversions have to be done. Then this is this isolation, which is mainly another word for putting everything off that CPU. 
Then, then the task, the polling or the, the measurement task should run on that, that CPU and then the resulted data is converted to the SIGROC format, which is easy, easy because it's basically a zipped data file with some metadata and of course it's open source and freely available, so that was a good candidate. Also, besides that, I really like to work with it. I think they have pretty good, uh, how are they called? Decoders, decoders for the signal. So there's a decent I2C decoder and stuff like this. Because it's targeted for embedded systems or low level systems, it should run everywhere on any shell that puts us some limit. Requirements for that are busy box S shell, but I also tested dash and bash and whatever I could find. You need zip for to create the output file and task set to run um, the polling thread on that separate CPU. To make sure it runs everywhere, I first tried uh, check bash zooms, which is, I think, a Debian script and helped me find some issues. Then I found a neat tool called sh shell check, which have for everything it reports, even a web page, which explains why you should do it in this way and not that way. I found that pretty neat, and then I thought I were good to go. Send the mails to the mailing list, and then the ultimate challenge for my shell script, which was Andy Shevchenko. I know you're watching. Hi. He is reviewing like hell in the com community and is awesomely great. He, uh, I don't know where he has his superpowers from, but I really didn't know where he has this interest in shell scripts. But he had some quite good ideas, um, and he also wasn't tamed by the fact that it is only intended as a de debug thing for developers. Um, so I think now we're at the point where this shell script is actually pretty stable. <laughs> what I was really amazed about is how difficult it is to isolate a CPU on a Linux system. I thought it was much easier. There used to be a kernel command line. It's, it's said in a footnote, either of CPUs which put, would do a lot of things I would imagine, but it is sadly deprecated. And they said use CPU sets instead. Uh, so that's what I did. I set a CPU set for a separate CPU, and, but then at least I found out, Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong, I had, he's still hacking. <laughs> um, I had to set the SMP affinity for all interrupts to exclude that CPU. I had to exclude that CPU for all work queues so that I was running through all the files setting the new masks. Then I needed to use task set to offload the already, uh, all the, the um, PIDs which were running on that CPU to somewhere else, which is in my current implementation, racy as it can be, but I didn't find an, a better way. So if someone knows, please tell me. And uh, then you find out that the kernel has nice protection me mechanisms like RCU um, complained someone that this CPU hasn't reacted for a while. And yeah, yes, it's sampling. So I needed to find out that there's a trigger where I could disable the stall check for RCU. And then... Hmm? Okay, and okay, which not for, for isolating, but I f thought setting the CPU frequency governor to performance was also a good idea to have. So, um, and then, except for some work use which are tied to the CPU, I got everything off that CPU and. and uh, I will say But this is quite a complex part of my script, and I was wondering about you, that. You are aware of uh, offloaded RCU, right? And what did I do? No, there, there's, I disabled the check, the stalled. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. You're basically saying, yeah. So basically, you're going to cause a garbage collection, like you know, to stop. No, you have to tell. There's specifically a kernel command line and stuff like that that says you can say uh, these CPUs will not run. Like the RCU callbacks will run on other CPUs. You offload the like uh, as a. Offload. Okay, can you can you tell me how to do that? I'll, t I'll tell you after. Yeah, 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 no, not now. Of course, no, not now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, the, what you just did was basically a workaround that actually will cause other problems. Okay. Well, luckily I was work mainly working on idle systems, so it didn't show up. 
So, and for uh, but in the end, um, this is all that was needed. Um, this is the DT binding. Luckily, it's it's debugging only. I don't have to send. Rob said uh, it's debugging only. You don't need to be an official schema. And yeah, you just have a comp compatible entry to load the driver. You tell which DPIOs you have wired to the to the uh, wires you want to probe, and then give them some names that you uh, so you can identify later them in pulse view in the viewing software. So here's my live demo number one, not. Uh, so what I tried first was snooping I2C traffic on, on, on my local machine to see if it works. So I had some wires putting the I2C bus to GPIOs and I was something like crazy and hey, yeah, it worked. I could, uh, when, I, when I added the I2C protocol analyzer, I could get totally reasonable results. So I was sampling a 400 kilohertz bus with I think 1.5 megahertz. Uh, Various tests showed me that I have a, I have a big little system on the, on, the, on the big cores I could sample up to 3.5 megahertz, but uh, yeah I I think I never went above one megahertz for for my tests. But uh, until that, with another I mean this is not production one. This is just an idle development system. But for that it worked reasonably well. Besides the fact that this is not a logic analyzer, it's a sloppy logic analyzer. Um, so since you have now seen a, a screenshot of Pulse View from the SIGROG project, I just have to say it. SIGROG is really a great free and open source project for, for logic analyzers and scoping software. But a, wow, it has having serious man power problems. Their problem is if you go to their website, it looks pretty professional, but it always used to be a handful of developers doing all the work, and now half of them disappeared. So that's really, I mean, all the discussions we have in the kernel are true and valid, but a, the, compared to other open source software, especially in user space, the kernel is in a really good condition regarding manpower. So. I try to help them with review, but also my day is, is limited. I can't help them all, but um, yeah, very sad. I hope something good will happen. So, live demo number two. I wanted to show how I uh, used the logic analyzer on a remote machine, which would have been set not in Japan, but at least in the UK. For, uh, my colleague put up uh, some wires to measure the PWM. But I can somehow tell you what's happened. Oh no, first I can tell you that it works quite easily, I think. This is, so this is the command line, this is the helper script, and I just say sample at 1.5 megahertz for 12 milliseconds, and this is a trigger, which basically says, so the first trigger, make sure that the first probe and the second probe are high, and then the first probe should stay high, and the second probe should have a falling edge. And then you start to trigger, and you can have quite a number of those combinations and so I think it's kind of neat and it worked reliably so far. To my big surprise, uh, the remote system said that it could not isolate the CPU, which I wanted. And this is where Murphy's law kicked in. It was an early board uh, uh, prototype. Oh, no, SMP. There is no separate CPU core which could do the polling for me. What to do? What would you do? Uh, yeah, Marek would call uh, enable SMP in the bootloader. I would have run nonetheless on the non-isolated CPU. I, I didn't mind. And I can say I don't have the data file here, so I can't show it, but it worked. So uh, even even the busy CPU was idle enough so that I could like trace 100 kilohertz, uh, probably more. I tested 100 kilohertz and uh, I got satisfying results. So again, the task was to see if does it work. Is there some P PWM output at all? Okay, there was. It was pretty close to 100 kilohertz, so I was happy. I kind of shortly asked myself why I did all this CPU isolation work, but uh, <laughs> I think it's still better than not to have it. Then Ulrich came along. <laughs> he had a great idea. Uh, he said, well, I don't want to do all this wiring you just mentioned. 
he found out that if you just read out the GPIO input register, you could see the values nonetheless, even if the even though the pins are maxed to I square she. So he just hacked my driver with some reading of the register and scoped that. It had the same scope than I did. And I thought this was super cool. I mean, if you have a remote, a board remotely and you do, don't even have to ask someone to put wires somewhere and you can sti still scope things, that's cool, right? That's hacking. So, uh, but I didn't want to use Ubisa re register offsets, so I hacked the GPIO subsystem so it could reuse GPIOs, GPIOs for input. Never upstreamable, but it worked. I also could get the same output. And so I went proudly to Linux Valet, the GPI subsystem maintainer, and uh, I found out, well, the GPI so sub subsystem knows about all this already. They call it the non-strict modes, and then you can um, read GPIOs or read the values from pins which are other mocks to something else, actually. The problem, yeah, okay, I said that. We can measure pins which are not even exposed on the board. Our hardware supports that, but not our pin control driver. Looks a bit like Murphy, but it's not. It was just, luckily, a one-line fix. You don't have to understand it, but it's basically saying, uh, if the pin, what I added, if it's not already mixed, keep it in the state which is, and then it, the GPIO subsystem can read from it. Which is super nice, because uh, the DT snippet for, for doing that looks pretty much exactly the same, the, only the uh, GPIOs, of course, have changed. These are now the GPIOs numbers, uh, which I would use if the I2C pins were mixed to GPIOs, but they aren't. They are still I2C pins, right? Okay. Anyhow, so pins mixed to I2C, we know the magic numbers, what they would have been, and we can scope that without doing, having actually a wire. Does it work on a local machine? Yes, it works. Awesome. And that really helped to find some other bugs meanwhile. Um, that was neat. It's still not a logic analyzer. So, and we really had that problem on the remote board. There was a PWM, another PWM core, which was not exposed to the board. So and I said, no problem, I can do it. Nope. Nope, I couldn't. So the line was in a high state all the time, didn't work. Murphy, again, it was a new generation of hardware that changed the GPIO module in a way, probably in a way that we lost this neat non-strict mode. So it seems that with the new hardware, we cannot read out the state of pins which are maxed to something else. That was a huge letdown. <laughs> I, I might still spend a day trying to figure a way if there, if there isn't a backdoor to get that values after all, but I, I have not very high hopes. So, that was a letdown, but on the other hand, as I said, there were other uh, problems where this uh, GPO logic analyzer turned out to be useful. <coughs> so, the current status is like this. It works reasonably well for most, for my mostly idle targets. I guess for yours as well. It will be interesting to see um, how it works if the system is under load. But for now, if you want to solve problems with it, I'd suggest to try to avoid the load. As I said, our hardware loss the non-strict GPI holes, I hope your hardware still has that. I th it's useful. And we can go even more wild or wilder. A friend uh, rightfully said, well, you're not limited to GPIOs when you're polling, right? I mean, you could actually sample bits and registers or even states of variables and put it all into that plot. This is nice. I think, um, for example, you could see uh, how the correlation is between some bits in your registers and the uh, outcome on some wires which you're scoping. Can you measure some timing distance with that? 
No. Why? It's not a logic analyzer. <laughs> you still have all the same problems. There might, uh, you don't have equidistant timing. Even if you're sampling at very high rates, it is still a polling thread on a Linux kernel system. You never know if something might uh, still delay you somehow. But if you, what you can get from that is you can get some correlations. Ah, th this goes first and this and then this goes down. And if you do multiple measures and they, it's co showing that consistently, I think you can do that. But if you want to measure actual timing, you should I think what you get is, well, okay, that's the order of magnitude. <laughs> uh, this is happening. Uh, I wouldn't be too... That, that this is a point the, where you th think, okay, I have an idea what to look for now. Now I get my real logic analyzer out. If your board is not in Japan. Um, yeah, this is... This was lots of fun to create, I have to admit. So, really, um, <laughs> I don't know how many oopses I've got, but <laughs> I, I was happy about it. Yeah, it, it, this is really kernel hacking, I think, where you don't... You know, I, I, have, I, I have invented also, or brought into mainline these I2C client, uh, um, client methods, where I2C can also be, you know, not the master, uh, or what? Political correct, the uh, controller of a bus, but on the other side, the listener, so to say. And um, that was a totally different thing. You had, really had to take care of lots of use cases and not to break anything and make it good for user space and all that. And it was also fun, but it was, it took a while. And here it was like, okay, I have this idea. Hey, and we got that idea. Let's try that. Oh, it works. No, it doesn't work. Yeah, lots of fun unless some people wanted to improve my shell scripts or reported back that the file names were different for them or they were using a different kind of CPU sets and all these kind of bug fixes. No, just kidding. I was very happy that they reported back and my logic analyzer is a bit more stable now. So, despite me asking the GPL uh, maintainers, it's still not upstream. Before this talk, it had chances to go upstream. I don't know what will happen after this talk. And it's still not a logic analyzer. This one is for you, Marek. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, but, but I got a quote of the week. If that is no reward, I don't know what else. So LWN, when I first introduced uh, this analyzer on the mailing list and saying, hey, I have a logic analyzer just by polling GPIOs and disabling the CPU, or not disabling, but uh, uh, disabling IRQs on, the, uh, on this CPU, I got the quote of the week. So. I think this is rewarding enough. <laughs> it's actually a good reward. With that, um, thank you very much. Um, I hope you will do crazy things with the kernel too and let us know about it. And uh, I am here for questions or comments right now or later, except for the usual talk by Marek, please. We have that often enough, right? Yeah, and of course, yeah, I have to thank Renesas, which was optimistic enough that that, that might be useful for our setup and uh, partly funded the work. Yay, cool. <laughs> I like your last. Um, <laughs> for from, I, have, I have a quick one. Did you consider uh, connecting uh, DMA and pointing it into the GPIO in register on one side and just triggering the DMA to read out the samples from the GPIO controller and store it into some sort of a buffer? Uh, I didn't consider that because what I, one reason why the GPIO maintainers are so happy about this thing is because I use a technique called, the, they invented the GPIO aggregator. So I, you can specify GPIOs from different GPIO banks, even as long as they are non, they don't sleep. Sleepable GPIOs are out of the question, and it will collect them for you into a byte. So you then, do, and this is not DMA compatible. 
you see, if you, if you go to different DM, uh, GPIO controllers, getting one GPIO from here from and from there, you can't do DMA. Yeah, because if you were to use the DMA, you would be able to avoid all this magic with isolating CPU cores and stuff. Yeah, but then you are limited to neighbor GPIOs. Yes, yes, you are. Thanks. Um, yeah, I have a question with regards to the non-strict mode. Um, have you asked your hardware designer if there was like, I don't know, some secret configuration or some ways to get that back? Because, uh, yeah, it was uh, my first question. Did you talk with the hardware yes, yes, engineers? Yes, I have asked them and uh, to, to my surprise the answer was like, no, nothing has changed. But if I look at, <laughs> look at, uh, look at the block diagrams in these SOCs, uh, a lot of things have changed. So I, I blame the language barrier between <laughs> English and Japanese. I might have to try again. Okay. And actually, I saw someone who did the same thing for the... What? No. <laughs> <laughs> for the M1 um, ASAI Linux uh, project. They, had, they did that, but in the hypervisor, I think, to do some uh, reverse uh, engineering. Yeah, it's good for reverse engineering. Yeah. Especially if you're non-strict GPIOs. So maybe you can talk with them. Maybe I have some, some tips or... The M1 or maybe M1 you, have, M1? you have more users, so you can get it merged. I don't know. That's interesting. I'm seeing some uh, possible use case uh, to this. For example, uh, recently I discovered that it was very difficult to find uh, um, SPDIF to uh, USB converters and uh, the bitrate is not very high, something like, I don't know, maybe something like 2 megabits or something like this. And um, I didn't consider using uh, a standard CPU and just isolating the core, but that's possibly something which could work, in fact, to use this to uh, resample uh, digital signals, uh, maybe put the data in a buffer and have uh, the regular CPU cores uh, aside, uh, uh, grab the data, maybe something like this. Yeah. yeah, I also got the idea, if if my code, which is currently shell script, but if is this code which basically offloads the CPU, if it turns to be not just hackish, but actually the thing to do, well, putting it in some kind of library so others could reuse it for their purposes would be probably, I mean, this was the part where the most work went in, so to, so to say. Okay, so I had an idea for an uh, interesting possible hack to avoid the non-strict issue. Oh, right. Have, have you tried throwing the MUX in GPIO mode reading and throwing it back? Again? So, so change the MUX to GPIO mode, then quickly read and immediately change the MUX back. So uh, there yeah. is going to be some, some capacitor there. Yeah. It's parasitic, but still, so you can try. I, I could try, but... Uh I don't know for our, our hardware, but um, so the iSQLT subsystem has uh, the possibility to uh, um, do a recovery if the bus broke down somehow, mm -hmm. and some controllers need to do that by moxing away from iSQLT to GPIO, and some reverted that because it could produce glitches on the bus. So. Yeah, yeah, it might be another hack which worked for some hardware, <laughs> but you have to really take care of the glitches when right. switch. But yeah, maybe. Oh yeah, right. I guess she's even more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Marek rightfully mentioned that, especially for I squared C, it's a there, there are pull-ups involved, so this is an, uh, that will take a while. Yeah, so I was thinking if you have in the same platform like two I squared C buses, if you connect them to each other, maybe you can use one bus to read the other and you can use it to read a higher rate. Uh, how do you, so you, you connect two I2C buses and you read the, uh, you read the states of the pins by, well, how? Yeah, I mean you uh, use two external wires to interconnect the buses yeah. so that you can use one bus to read the other and you can sample the data at the same rate? Uh, you mean you don't sample like the logic values of the bus, but just like start condition address or something like this? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, um, 
depends a lot on the ice cache controller. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Other than that, you also uh, sometimes you want to check, um, for example, if the start and stop conditions how they look like, mm -hmm. and you would lose the detail of that. Yeah. Maybe if it's the same platform, we can use the same configuration so that they are aligned to each other and they are synchronized. I think we're entering the point where I have to say, show me the code. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, might be worth a try. Yeah. Yeah. Can we maybe use eBPF for the triggers? <laughs> <laughs> I think we can also use EBPF for, for sampling, right? <laughs> for, uh, the, what's it called? The um, decoders? Maybe we can do that in EBPF? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Hi. Uh, have you considered using the same API for hardware uh, uh, logic analyzers? So let's say you, you buy one and that should be uh, your API should be the one uh, to use and then we can use your script to uh, program the logic analyzer. The API to what? Yeah, so you, you, have an a, you have an API the kernel. For the lo logic analyzer, for the user space to kernel? Yes. You yeah. have some debug FS files, yes. Yeah. Um, is that intended to be used also for, can we use that? Same maybe for hardware uh, for hardware logic analyzers. Will it be an, yeah. Can we make a standard app to uh, to communicate with logic analyzers? <laughs> I, I think it's a similar answer. There, there was one reviewer who said, "Hey, these files are in debug FS. Can't you put them in sysfs so they are more visible?" And I was saying, "No, <laughs> this is a debug thing. <laughs> it depends on expert for a reason. You won't. Most people won't see it because you have to know." what you're doing. Why? Because it's a sloppy GDIO logic analyzer. And if you wanted an API to mi mix it with proper logic analyzers, I think that's not a good idea. If you want an API for other sloppy logic analyzers, yeah, or maybe. <laughs> You're maybe saying a bit too much, no, this is not a logic analyzer, but something like uh, 31 years ago, there was a guy who said, uh, this is just a toy project and it will never get <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, if you really think about it, 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 it's basically a matter of trust. You know, how much do you trust your system to be polling at that rate? How much do we trust an FPGA to actually do, do what it's programmed to. Uh, yeah, it's reasonable to trust the FPGAs a little bit more, but at the end, it's all a matter of trust. And if you know your system very well, and as I said, my systems were idling mostly around, so I, I have quite high trust in my measurements. But I can't give it to all you and saying this is a logic analyzer, because then people will put it under high load and will have running on x86 where you have. Uh, system management interrupts and they wonder why they just measure nothing. But you know, the, the, the cheap $10 uh, USB based uh, analyzer that you can find, find uh, in everywhere on the net only contain 30 microcontroller and uh, they are much less accurate than your code probably. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm the worst. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, <laughs> lots of people buy them because uh, they are advertised as logic analyzer. It's just matter of uh, accuracy and uh, if you know uh, how much inaccurate you are and uh, you can measure the, the drift uh, for a so lot of people it will be enough. So that's what I do. Before the measurement sta starts uh, I'm just polling the GPIOs a thousand times and measure the time how much um, is this 1000 pollings cost and then I know what the, the desired frequency from the user and then I know how much I have to delay to get to match that frequency using end delay. That's how it works. So if there's a systematic offset, I can kind of capture that. But as I said, if you have a system management, lucky, I know this system does not have system management interrupts, so I'm safe. But if you have one, yeah, you're lost. But if you're debugging, it basically means you measure another time. And maybe you're lucky then. <laughs> Uh, 
In addition to your debug, debug FS kind of output, I wonder if you thought about just ex, um, sending trace points so you could see your, in kernel shark, you could see your I squared C signal alongside some other events like frequency change events or something like that. I was thinking of a, that could be actually quite useful to have essentially your, your I squared C bus lines or whatever you're sampling in kernel shark along with the other events that you actually care about from the kernel. I have not thought about this, but I agree that sounds like an interesting idea. <laughs> Three, two, one, the end. Thank you very much.